<laughs> Father Abbott has told me where. <laughs> where is it? And so, with that introduction, um, I'd like to warmly welcome Father Abbott Damien here to Our Lady of Fatima, Russian Byzantine Catholic Church. And as I mentioned in the homily, Father and I first met 1974. First, in San Francisco. Really? Later than that? He must be much older than me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give him a little forgiveness. A little memory loss there. It wasn't until the early 80s. <laughs> that was 81. All right. Really? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It happens to all of us. I, I was still a Carmelite. You were a Capuchin. But, but we, we knew each other as religious, living in San Francisco. And then um, we worked together at St. Anthony Foundation. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Father worked with the the elderly and the tenderloin, and I worked with the homeless, mentally ill, especially homeless women in San Francisco. And um, we both had a great interest in Mount Tabor for many years. And I first met the founder, Abbot Boniface, in 1976. A later father entered the community, became the abbot, as he is now. And, um, and in, in, in time, a distinguished iconographer. So we're very grateful to have him here today um, to explain to us the practical aspects of iconography, the artistic aspects, but also the theological, liturgical, and spiritual aspects of icono Christian iconography. So a very, very warm welcome to the Reverend Father Abbot Damien. Honestly, and I don't say this because you're supposed to say this to be polite, but it is, I'm really happy to be here. There are some important connections between Our Lady of Fatima uh, and the uh, Byzantine or Russian Catholic Church here in our monastery, and that going back to the earliest days, Father Boniface had friends here in this community and the founders of this community. So. It's, uh, it's always a circle that God is creating, bringing things full circle and to completion. And you notice, maybe I hope I wasn't distracting any of you, I couldn't be in your little church downstairs without looking up because the ceiling was so beautifully decorated. I, I believe this uh, convent was consecrated by the Sisters of the Holy Name, is that probably right? But, that if you look around, the work that was done in that chapel is, is really exquisite. But you have to look carefully, and you'll notice that beam that is now over the area that is the sanctuary, when I should have been paying attention to the prayers. I was looking at the beam because I noticed that unlike any of the other beams in the church that all have very beautiful Western devotional images, that beam has three symbols that are all proper to the Byzantine Christian tradition. Right smack in the middle is the mother pelican feeding her chicks, which is the old Byzantine symbol for the Eucharist. When a mother pelican is starving or has nothing else to feed her chicks, she will press her own breast to feed the blood from her body to her chicks, and that was seen as, as a, a symbol of the Eucharist even from the earliest times in Byzantine theology. Then to the right is a reference that is commonly used in the West as well, but very much in the East, a symbol of Moses' staff and the cross being this symbol of death, the snakes wrapped around the staff of Moses because people were being killed, the people of Israel were being killed by the biting of snakes. Maria should get a dog on a stick. But um, the, uh, 
and as, as they were dying, and so Moses was told to lift up the staff that had these snakes on it, and the very thing that was the symbol of death became the symbol of healing. And so the Byzantine hymns all connect that symbol with healing and the cross as a symbol of not death, but of new life. And then to the left, the furthest, this is all on a wooden beam, and you have to look carefully. You might even have to get your binoculars out or get your prescription and prove. The very left image is the image that in the Eastern Church is called the face not made with human hands. In the West, that image is commonly called Veronica's Veil. And even though the stories are told differently, we think it's one of those mysterious stories that com the tradition complements each other. In the West, the story of Vera Icona, the true icon, this woman holding a cloth that presses it to Christ's face while he is suffering. In the East, the, the story is told that there was this prince or king that was dying of a terrible disease, and he sent uh, emissaries or um, people from his court to go and get Jesus to come and heal him in the land of Edessa, which would now be, I think, part of Turkey. And uh, they said, oh, no, no, Jesus is consecrated to this work in Jerusalem. He can't come to Edessa. But um, a, a cloth was brought to the king, because otherwise these guys were going to get their own you know, heads cut. And uh, the, the cloth was lifted up, and there was the face of Christ, just like Vera Icona, just like Veronica's veil, uh, this notion of the true icon. And in seeing Christ, in seeing our humanity refined and deified, divinized, we too receive that hope that we will be restored in our proper image as the children of the Most High God. Mm. But those three images are in the beam of your church downstairs here. <laughs> and there, there are no, one might say that there are coincidences, and, and there are, I guess, in some, maybe there are lots of accidents, but maybe, maybe there is a miracle involved here. Maybe everything is a part of the plan of God. A few years back, a great scientist from Italy, an astro-nuclear physicist, came to give a talk at the Ukrainian Catholic Church in Ukiah under the pastorship of Father David Anderson. This, when I heard the title of this scientist, I, I knew that I was filling in for da Father David at the time, and I knew just by hearing her title that I probably shouldn't go to the talk because I wouldn't understand anything that she was saying. It was too, she was too smart and it was going to go, all go over my head. So, but because I was filling in at the time and the little church hall was full of lots of people, I thought, well, I better make an appearance. So after she got talking, I snuck in the back door when the lights were out. If they had told me she was showing pictures, I would have come earlier. <laughs> but she was doing a PowerPoint presentation because she was one of the scientists that had been used, and, and she was giving lectures at Stanford University, this is maybe three years ago, on the whole notion of what the meaning of these pictures coming back from the Hubble telescope and the, the pictures that they were taking of the universe, what it all meant. They needed these scientists, people like this doctor, to come in and help decipher uh, and, and give meaning to, to these pictures that were being seen. There was lots of, surprisingly, a lot of color out there in the universe. And, and she started off by saying to us, when most of you look out into the night sky, um, unless you are an astronuclear physicist, and I'm not, or that you're an astronomer, astronomy, astronomer, ast you're an astronomer, or an astronomically sensitive person. Uh, when you look at the sky, you see the proper arrangement of stars. I don't. I, I think it's beautiful. I see a jumble of stars. And in fact, this is going to be a, it is a plug for the monastery. If you want to see stars, and I don't know why it is, but on our property, 
you can see every star that God has made that is to be seen in the sky. For some reason, we're in a zone where there's just no light pollution. And so when you come up to the monastery, a man who is with us today, who has some vision problems, has lived in, and nothing against New York, but he's lived in the city of New York all of his life, and, and is still a young man in his 30s, and has never seen a star until he came to Mount Tabor. He got to see a star for the first time. And you can imagine what that meant to him. It was like a miracle. And it's helped me now, whenever I'm going back to my room, I just stand there in the courtyard and just look up at the stars. And I'm so grateful that I can see the stars. I'm so grateful that I live in a place where the stars are able to proclaim the glory of God. But this scientist was explaining to us that the stars aren't just, she, didn't, she wasn't giving a religious talk. This was a, a talk about the science of the stars and the universe around us. In fact, she was even challenged at one point because a number of the people that came for this talk were also uh, astronomers and, and people of science. Because she said, if you look at the stars and you study the patterns, you come to understand there's a perfect order to the arrangement of everything in the astronomical uh, arrangement up there. And she used the pattern of what some of you might be familiar with, and I'm afraid I failed chemistry, so I don't remember what it looked. But you know what an atom, you know, your, your teacher gave you something. I forget what the atom... But they put those, make those styrofoam balls and then something, and they say, now that's what an atom looks like. Well, of course, you don't care because you can't see an atom. But the smallest element, they now say there's something even smaller, I guess whatever's inside of that thing. But the smallest element of creation generally that has been discerned is an atom. The wood inside this little table is made of, is an, has an atomic structure. The bones in your body have an atomic structure. And as this science pointed, scientist pointed out to us, so do the stars. They follow exactly this same pattern. She said it's perfectly ordered, and that's when the scientist's hands went up and said, are you trying to prove the existence of God by, you know, this ordered universe, and she said, sir, I'm speaking to you as a scientist. I am not able to really prove anything. I'm just relating to you my studies of the pictures coming back from the Hubble telescope, and this is what I've seen. You can disagree, you can see things differently, but I'm not speaking of my belief in God in this particular talk. But at the end of the talk, since most of these people were people that had come from the church, she did say that, you know, for her personally, her study of the stars as a, an Italian woman, as a, as a Catholic, as a Christian person, she really appreciated the fact that in seeing this ordered perfection, that she was part of that. She wasn't an accident. She wasn't just some anomaly in the plan of the Creator. That was all nice and fine until she finished her talk. Now remember, I came into the talk late because I didn't want to be bored, and instead I was taken in by both her intelligent way of communicating, but also her simplistic uh, use of, of English words, and even though she knew most of us were not scientists, when she, she had been seated the entire uh, lecture, and at the end of her lecture, I realized she couldn't get up. She had to push herself onto a roller board because she had been born without any lower extremities. And I was thinking, wait a minute, she just finished saying she was part of this perfect order of the plan of God. And she, I, I you know, had to run after her as she rolled herself faster than I could run out of the parking lot. I said, doctor, doctor, now wait a minute. You know, I've got something to ask you. And she said, you know, Father, when I was a little girl, my mother would put me out in the backyard and tell me, look up, honey. Look up into the skies. It's true, you're not going to be able to play ball. You're not going to be able to run around with all the other kids. But you can see. You have eyes to see. 
you study that sky and you see what God is saying to you. And out of that, she became this astronuclear physicist. Well, I told her I'd been looking up the skies all my life, and I didn't see anything of what she was seeing. And it really brings us back to the point that I guess I, I do want to start with. We've talked about iconography, or we've introduced this theme to you, or we kind of cajoled you into coming up into this little room here, to talk about iconography as a place where we experience a communion between heaven and earth. One of the principles that has always been a conflict for Christians from the beginning of time, and maybe for many religious people, is how can material and immaterial realities either complement each other or at least not be in conflict with one another? How can we say that God is incomprehensible, unnameable, invisible, completely beyond any category, and at the same time, at least in the Christian experience, to say that, God is born, that God is a baby, God has a mother. That's, some people are, even today are offended when we give the title to Mary as Theotokos, Mary the mother of God. I happen to have the great privilege, this is not my work, I wish I could say that it was, it's one of our friends who's here and He's hiding with a little person in the other room just for the moment. But this image of the Theotokos is a proclamation of the material and the immaterial world coming together. That's what we mean by communion or union between these two realities. This is not a pretty lady with a fat chubby baby. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Western art or other approaches to art. I'm just to explain why Byzantine iconography, this, this image is a theological statement about who this baby is. I mentioned to you earlier that I worked in a community where, and that's what babies do. They babies make loud noises, and probably, sometimes I think they signal to us to shut up. I oftentimes find when I'm preaching in church and a baby starts crying, it's because I've preached too long. Father Kevin, you remember that. The baby goes off. That's a sign. Not that he would ever go too long, but you're allowed, even you, those members of the parish here, you're allowed to squeal if the priest carries on too long. That'll remind everybody about Jesus. So anyways, Jesus was a crying baby, uh, and, but that's not what this icon is talking about. It's not just talking about the, the purely human relationship between the mother and child. That's referenced because here we have a child that is proportionally the size in proportion to the mother of a baby, but it's not a baby. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelleth in Christ. And so this icon is trying to make that statement that this, what we are venerating here, is the God who has, the immaterial, unnameable God who has entered into the material world. And that's why we can talk about what we're talking about today communion and unity between heaven and earth, between the material and the immaterial world, because of this mystery. But you know from the beginning of the Christian movement, and it's always been a movement, I love the fact that the early Christians were not, they weren't even called Christians, they were called a movement. They were called the movement, the people of the way a people who were moving towards not just something, but towards somebody, someone, the embracing of the reality of a God who becomes a person, no longer or not possibly just a thought. As I said, uh, for a number of years working in a, a community where most of my neighbors were iconoclasts, this imagery offended them until, and they had reason to be offended, because Scripture is very clear when it says to us, 
in the book of Exodus, and of course, being a good Catholic priest, I, I don't have it memorized. I have to look it up. Uh, thou shall not, thou shall not make for yourself any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water or under the earth. You shall not bow down to them. What did you see some of these Christians doing this morning they came into the church and they bowed down before this image. I could usually get away with Irma Mae Biedenbo, one of my neighbors who was coming over and said, okay, I'm going to let you have pictures of Jesus over there, but you don't just have pictures of Jesus. You have pictures of Mary and you have pictures of Barbara and Demetrius and all those other folks. And you're bowing down and you're worshiping them because that's what we do. We bow down and we would say that we're venerating them. And then you even saw people doing this. <laughs> That's really uncomfortable for most of us that have grown up in a Western world to touch material things and to venerate them in that way. Does that not suggest something close to idol worship? Thou shalt not bow down before these things and serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. There's even a condemnation that comes along with this. I am a jealous God visiting iniquity upon the children to the third and fourth generation, and so on and so on. Now, I, I am one who venerates the Word of God, and I do believe, and I mean, I even kiss the Word as well. So, I, I would not want to offend God in any way, but of course, I, as I said to Irma May and some of my other neighbors when giving them a tour of the church, but the Bible doesn't forbid the making of images. It, it forbids the making of certain images. It forbids the making of any image that gets in the way of your relationship with the divine. Because look what happens. That was just, you saw me turn in the Bible here, whichever Bible you're using, just a couple, two pages. On the third page in Exodus 25, Verse 17, then you shall make a mercy seat. And then he goes on to say, and thou shall make, thou shall make two cherubim on each side of the mercy seat out of graven images <clears throat> carved out of gold. And, place, and, and they will be focused on this ark, this place where God will be encountered as the living God among the people of Israel. So what kind of God is this? It, does God suffer from bipolarity? Do, does God have good days and bad days? Or so? Of course not. It's when we read the word of God carefully, we understand that the making of holy things was required. We would say in the, in the Byzantine and the Eastern and the Oriental traditions of the church, artwork is not a luxury, as I said downstairs. It's a necessity. It draws the eyes into worship. Now, again, that might be a job security issue for people like Raymond or myself or other people that make icons, you know, to support ourselves uh, or teach about iconography. Um, I always tell people, you know, the more images, the better. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, it, it is also because I really do believe this. And I can't tell you how often we just got a phone call at the monastery of a woman who had gone to a thrift store up in Santa Rosa, and there she found an icon that was just the face of Christ. She took it to the Orthodox uh, Church in Santa Rosa of, of St. Seraphim, and then she took it to the little bookstore uh, called Not of This World, an Orthodox uh, bookseller up there. And in both cases, they couldn't believe when she showed them the price on the back it was $7.50. They thought she had, it must have been a mistake, you know, $750, maybe $7,000. It was an old icon that it ended up at this thrift store. And she said, I'm a Buddhist Unitarian. And I just walked into that bookstore and that face spoke to me. She said, I have never had a piece of art speak to me. And I felt like the, this face was even maybe possibly calling my name. I heard my name 
coming and she said I've just been and so she started calling around and she ended up calling of all places our weird little monastery way up in the middle of nowhere how she found us I don't know and and you know then is talking to me talk about weird I mean strange and and works I'm ex trying to explain to her that is what we call the face of God not made with human hands. And it's a reference to this miraculous image that we normally think of in, in the West as the Veronica's veil or the face uh, uh, that was given to Abgar to help with his healing. Images can, artwork, beauty, can help connect heaven and earth. God, when he created the garden, made it very clear that this was a place of communion and, and union with God. Fortunately, this is an easy verse to find because it's the very first verse of Genesis, so I didn't even have to mark it, but um, we hear Jesus calling. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. There's chaos, that tohu bohu, I think it's referred to as in Hebrew meaning just the, the elements just swirling around as it were. When we start the beginning of an icon, um, we're going to talk a little bit about today, and this, this talk won't go on ad infinitum, I promise that. In fact, at some point I want after, maybe after I've gone on for a half an hour, would somebody please tell me when we're at 1.30? <laughs> well, that's not my fault. You guys got started late. Uh, Is it after 1.30? Really? 1.32. Oh, my gosh. Oh, well, see what happens when you're having such a great time. And I'm not even showing pictures yet. So, uh, But we work with real wood, by the way. And, you know, that's important because wood is connected with trees. Trees, believe it or not, are connected with salvation. I know we've got some Franciscans here and maybe some people of Franciscan spirit. And so, I mean, they would have us all living in the trees, but we don't want to go, don't have to go that far, especially you city dwellers. Uh, they, in the Eastern tradition, there are dendrites, uh, monks and nuns that lived in the trees. And there they experienced the fullness, or stylites, if you want to live on top of a pillar. You city dwellers are kind of like stylites in that you live on top of cement blocks and all of that kind of stuff, but you do, you know, have lots of decorations on the inside. Um, but a tree speaks of that tree in the garden. And, and in that garden, Adam and Eve dwelt in full communion with the divine. So much so that St. Simeon, the new theologian, says... He's adverse to referring to Adam and Eve as naked, as we say in the South, or naked. <laughs> because he said they weren't naked. In Psalm 103, as you'll pray tonight in Vespers, those of you that are so courageous, I won't be. I mean, we'll be, we have to go back to the monastery after this talk. But um, Psalm 103, God is clothed as in a garment of light. Well, St. Simeon said, who isn't reading that? If God is clothed with light, then Adam and Eve were clothed with light. It's their light, the light, that communion with divine light. That's what they lost, and that's why they felt naked. They didn't need clothes, because what do they grab from? They grab from the trees to cover themselves, because the trees hadn't lost their original intimacy with divine glory. The trees, and that's part of why there is maybe a so-called ecological movement, an appreciation of creation, because it still speaks of that original communion with divine glory that we so yearn for. We want to get reconnected with God and the beauty of God. And we can, and we must, and we will, because the icons promise us that it's possible. As we work with the wood of the tree, we also know that it's by a tree that we got kicked out of the garden, and it's by a tree that you get back invited back in. The tree of the cross is our key. It's our passport back into communion with the divine persons of the Holy Trinity. 
that through the tree of the cross, because Christ will also say to us, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow yourself. And we know, brothers and sisters, those of you that are mature enough to know this, uh, that the denial of self is not the true self. It's the denial of the false self, so that the true self can truly be alive and be activated. And, and, and all that is good, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit can be activated in your persons, your material identity. You are supposed to be communicators of immaterial realities. That's what we mean by sacrament or sacramental action. And, and you have the capacity to be a sacramental, a, a, a mysterious conveying of truly spiritual realities in your bodies, in your life, in your history. There's this wonderful example of, of uh, the, the sermon of um, Metropolitan Philaret of Moscow on the Ukrainian church. Anybody that's Ukrainian, forgive me for making any reference to Russians at the present moment. But um, the uh, a great saint, uh, Philaret of Moscow, said in speaking about the Annunciation, he, he got up to preach it as said, and then he almost couldn't get it out. He said, dare I say that the God who said, let it be, and there came to existence a sun and a moon, let it be, and there came into existence trees and animals and plants and even the human persons, that this creative power and divine force who all that he has to say is, let it be, and it comes into existence, now comes to a human person and says to her, I am waiting for your let it be. You may now speak as I speak. And it's only when Mary says to the angel, let it be done in my body, in my history, as you have said, I will let the immaterial world enter into my existence, commune with me. Yes, a human person, a real woman, a real mother. I mean, she becomes a real mother by saying, let it be done unto me. And Philaret, you know, just at that point almost collapsed, just thinking about that. Is it possible to say that this great God would want to use you and me to be vessels of divine glory? Going back to St. Simeon, he says, yes, because we were made in the image and likeness of God, which means we were clothed with light. So in the icons, you'll see all of the saints, not just Christ. I have these beautiful examples. Again, I wish I could say that I painted them. I didn't. I'll introduce you to the iconographer a little later, but I just want to make sure you first talk to me first before you get distracted. By <laughs> this blue garment here shouts out light. It doesn't speak about shadowing. It's true, there are darker edges and darker places in the garment. If you didn't have the, the distinctions between darker areas and lighter areas, it would just be one blob of light. This careful iconographer has very traditionally communicated, there's light coming out of the garments. And all of the saints are dressed this way with garments full of light. The, these are icons that are just in process, but even this icon of St. Gertrude of Elfta, not to be confused with Gertrude of Hackborn. I was actually painting some icons for a wonderful Benedictine community, and um, I'm afraid I got my wires crossed, and I was painting, uh, I didn't realize there were two, these are basically both the same woman, but I, I was mixing up their symbolism. Gertrude of, of Hackborn actually should be older. She's going to be the younger one. I just have to put some... Uh, deified wrinkles in her face, <laughs> and uh, I've got to take the rings off of her hand. It's a wonderful story. Here, these sisters are consecrated to the patronage of, actually, this saint, St. Gertrude of Helfta. St. Gertrude of Hackborn was the abbess at the same time that St. Gertrude of Helfta started uh, receiving visions. And, 
and it's, I'm not going to give you a whole talk on St. Gertrude, but it is a wonderful vision that the sisters themselves weren't able to celebrate fully because we didn't really know what it meant. I started reading through these revelations, all of which were being translated from German by one of the sisters. And it ends up that one of her experiences of God, this is way before there was devotion to the Sacred Heart. Um, Gertrude of Helfta, I'm going to get them mixed up even as I'm speaking, stood before this image of Christ appearing to her and he told her to reach out her hand. And as he took her hand, he pressed it up against his chest. And she said her hand seemed to move through that chest cavity to his very heart. And when she pulled out her hand, her hand was covered with seven rings, golden rings. She was covered in gold. And she said, all I, could, all I could think of was how much I loved this being that I was experiencing, but then that I was loved by this being. This being loved me. And I was consecrated unto God, and God chose to be consecrated unto me. And so her, her uh, ring finger had three rings, just to make it clear that she was his and he was hers and da 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 but all the other fingers had rings on it too so that seven this number of perfection and all of a sudden as we're all we're trying to do is paint these little you know wooden boards we we start to be introduced to this woman who died 800 years ago and yet had this profound experience of God and just like people in your lives as we said earlier this morning praying for the dead we don't pray for them as if they've just simply biologically disintegrated we pray for them knowing that they are more alive now than they ever were when they exist I mean who of us would say that we're like fully fully alive Saint Gertrude is alive and so in the icon we paint a window or a